Have you ever met a truly mature person? Seriously. Have you? And what would that be? What would that look like? Um, this is something that um, I think we are world historically pressured now to, to consider, particularly since Kant urged upon us the recognition and realization that one likes to choose immaturity. We get off on it. We like to stay there. We love our, our tethers. Of course, one has to break up the we here. For Goethe, my main man Goethe, immaturity was a good thing. He had what he called wiederholte pubertät, so recurrent puberty which, you know, at the age of over 70, he fell in love with a 17-year-old, and it kept him going, it kept him writing. So there's, perhaps, if you switch on the transvaluating machine, there's a good immaturity, and there's a bad immaturity. Very bad immaturity. <laughs> so, um, for Lyotard, who worked with Wolfgang to um, envisage what EGS might be in terms of a kind of anarchist immaturity that opens up to thought in a way that would not necessarily um, fit a university. In other words, an affirmative place for affirmative misfits to which I was invited to join the team of misfits. Um, for Lyotard, adolescence or, or the uh, jarring violence and prod out of immaturity toward maturity comes as a call. So adolescence, or what Freud calls the violent alteration, occurs to someone and for Lyotard, the examples that if we had time we would interrogate more carefully, are Abraham, who gets a call that is a shakedown, a freak out. He can't field it, he can't handle it. But he has to respond or stand up and go up the mountain, as some of us have done. <laughs> responding to other calls that we can or cannot handle, that were or were not meant for us. So for Lyotard, the example of a kind of deracinating call that risks destroying you because you can't handle it, say, if you're called to become the President of the United States of America. <laughs> Knocks you out in a certain way. Another example is Freud's Emma who's kind of jeered at by a shopkeeper who, who um, violates her verbally without trigger warning and turns her suddenly into a sexual being. And this is a shakedown that traumatizes her. So it's also, as you can see, a question of being addressed at a time you're not ready to take the call and being felled by the call. Again, Kant says we would prefer not to deal with this call. Just drop it or block it. <laughs> Don't take the call. So today I'd like to talk to you about a crisis in immaturity, um, which for Lyotard involves the necessity of our considering what adolescence or pre-adolescence and the dramatic narratives and drama queeny excesses of the adolescent might have to do with political theory. There's no politics without a consideration of adolescent terror. Uh, for one of our friends, Larry Rickles, who teaches here as well, the um, shift from a call to immediate false assumption of authority 
is something that he studies as the Hitler Jugend. So the Hitler Youth, suddenly these teenagers were made political authorities in an entirely different set of determinations for the most part. But what it means to call up the adolescent in one it doesn't mean developmentally, historically, we're talking about an adolescent, but the regression to adolescent, the adolescent shock of being when being called to stand up and do something or be something or become something is um, something that pushes you into an existential um, zone of greatest discomfort. So um, some of this may seem a little apparatic or if not soap operatic, but also um, complicated. So let's try to follow the itineraries that we are stuck with. I would much rather be discussing other things with you. I'm exhausted by my political um, involvement of late, since last November. And I'm also trying to understand what civic grievance is in the work that I'm doing now, and how the complaint, the social complaint, or the complaint modulates into forms of protest. I know our French friends here um, have been involved in protests, have gotten themselves arrested, and so on and so forth. Oh, was that a secret? Um, so we, we um, I guess, are asked once again to think about what kind of a, a questioning or form of um, calling, being called upon protest involves and how to see it in terms of its historicity. Yesterday's protest may not be tomorrow's form of protest. And what about the dead letter boxes that some envoys of protesting behaviors lands in? So let me bring back our friend Vanna Hamacher. And to Vanna and to Anne and to all our masters and friends who can't be here, let us welcome them and shelter them and and think with them and have them help us now with their thought, which needs to be read in a very serious and engaged way. So let me bring Vanna up for us. He's Germany's contemporary version of Hegel, I would say. And he warned us that protest as, a, as form and tactical maneuver may not suffice in the face of this calamity. We must look to something which functions like ostracization in the Athenian polis. Donald Trump and his destructive horde must be ostracized with violent precision and unrelenting determination. So that's one of Vanna's last emails or envoi to me. And I feel it's almost an injunction, what kind of an act is it to send this to us today? So let us continue to think with that. What would be adequate to the exigencies of the moment? And what do theorists and philosophers, analysts, therapists, artists need to tune themselves to? As a wave of action that starts us off, protest must be analyzed, therefore understood, considered in terms of its deficiencies without overlooking the proud, if brutal, history of breakout syntax of civic responsibility. We were told at the time that the bombs stopped flying, napalm had ceased cratering the earth when protests surged during the Vietnam era under the slogan the whole world is watching. Of course, in our class with Pierre, we're, we're trying to pick up the pieces of the shattered world, world shattered through Heidegger and, and others. 
So there was a moment <laughs> where the whole world was watching. Philosophically inflected and pragmatically tuned, the scope of protest, its ability to affect change or blow the whistle, its capacity ethically to produce a necessary halt becomes a matter of calculating what our time can tolerate, absorb, or feed on, the responsiveness that protest presupposes or abandons, the medial imperative to show and to conceal, white out, certain kinds of historical reference. Don't forget that this school was also founded as a, a thinking, a place for us to think about media, journalism, the way certain types of discursive formations open up and disclose a wounding of a historical and social nature, but also as in the first waves of the unending Gulf War, white out and efface um, the showing of, of what is going on in the Middle East um, and in Afghanistan and so on. So the, the, this is something that I've worked on elsewhere, which is the way TV operates as an effacement of um, the very stories you suppose it's supposed to tell us. And, and how does that effacement tell or refuse to tell something that we do and don't have access to? Some protests have nowhere to go but a dead letter office. Other flexes of protest muscle appear to meet a target, make things take measure, die down where necessary, or expose their repressive brutality in ways that end a certain run of aggressive indecency. So there's still a channel of idealism where you think they were caught on tape and they're gonna have to stop the nonsense. Are we still in that kind of uh, space where one can catch a criminal behavior? At this point in our history, a series of reflections and interventions must ask the tough questions without deflating a sense of the power punch that a protest nation must deliver. Protest, an appetite of civic grief that must be increased if continually modified, requires us to assume the posture of hyper-ethicity even when we sense and fear the pump up of resistance to be somehow faltering crashing against a wall of reduced expectation. So even if you know it's not going to be heard or you can't affect change or you suppose you can't or you don't know what the hell you're doing, you still have to um, hope that sometimes it works. At other times, we are outplayed and undermined. Most of us ready to stand up do so warily on the faltering Grundstruktur or fundamental structure of the understanding that at bottom, let's face it, this can't go on, but we must go on. Okay, we must go on, we can't go on. The scene of betrayal was so colossal and multi-appointed in November, and I'm sorry to bring you back to that when we get to be in the sublime Alps, that I don't know whether I, for one, will rock out of my hellhole anytime soon. Still, every other day I do send out a hologram to rally the troops and tropes that might revive a numbed and medicated body politic that feels and looks like roadkill. I go into my obsessive loop, mulling over the details of note. What the hell happened here? Or, what the hell happened here? <laughs> Is the ascension of Trump a matter largely of misogynist apprehension, white masculinist payback, homophobic overflow just when we thought that gay marriage and divorce equality had settled in, cozy 
and nauseatingly equalized to straight normativity? Give me another smack of misogyny, the way it fastens onto the imaginary body of a maternal shape and shadow. I've analyzed the lethal prompts of a maternal empire that gets swooped down on according to the logic and habits of military aggression. So if we had time, we we think of how, especially in the American um, military worlds, the um, body of the earth that is um, bombed is always maternalized. One could say that the field of anal sadistic military aggression was my specialty, part of my critical arsenal as I probed the arse upward maneuvers inherent to my military domains and invested sites of psychoanalytical mappings. Now, military is where, where I got um, what I got from the great writer Kleist, Heinrich von Kleist, who was who wrote with military precision and um, maneuvered things and signifiers with, well, he was a military guy, with, with um, tremendous know-how and skill. I take it as rigorously necessary that Trump's mouth hole be the flapping aperture to funnel floods of radically unleashed aggression, the toxic spill of excrementalized language, part of his recourse to a crucial intersection where Twitterature meets shitterature. <laughs> Thank you. What Freud has seen as part of the expression of sheer pleasure, puerile and adolescent, involved in an unrestrained propensity to leak language, ugly language, fugly language, releasing the overjoyed slosh of smut. By the way, I come with subtitles, as you know, and footnotes, so if there's any words you don't know, call me. <laughs> smut, I don't know how you would translate it into English, but smut is dirty, so-called dirty language, and Freud reminds us that people get very excited about the free use of dirty language, and they're overjoyed. Um, as Trump was when he was listening to that miscreant, uh, right? He was so happy until someone smacked him around and said, you have to actually denounce this. Okay. Pierre Alferi, whom some of you have heard of, has recently written about extreme texts of brevity, micrograms, where Twitterature figures prominently, or rather minutely, nanotechnologically signaling. Shitterature is mine, however, where I dwell on the locution, sacred, primal, moving, like, holy shit. <laughs> But that is another story, another narrative spill, even if it can be seen to drip into our political body and deliver an offensive rhetoric of elimination. I am, besides being Josephine, the queen of the mouse folk, I'm also a theorist during my day job who likes to get a hold on the way power operates when authority is running on empty, as Hannah Arendt and Alexandre Kojev feared in the face of totalitarian takeover. So what's surprising perhaps to you is that when there's a totalitarian uh, mow down, it's usually in the face of the vanishing and disappearance of authority, according to our um, important political philosophers. Donald Trump carries no authority which is precisely where the problem lies in the violent shudder of the vanishing of authority that this morph of a loser son embodies. His fear of contamination, his germophobia, a prompt to xenophobic uh, phobic excess and severe misogyny, the disgust promoted by the smell of women 
motor the purported toughness on issues of immigration and other exclusionary operations for which the team of garish white billionaires has already made itself known. Regarding their leader, he comes up as puerile, bereft of super egoical controls. His is not merely an idiot, though Lacan has had a lot to say about the dim interiors of the idiot king. Again, if we had time, we'd take the off-ramp now and think about the idiot king that Lacan uh, nailed for us, a despotic emergence. He is a map of symptomatological heaves that restrict and bind him, a circumstance which no one would really give a fuck about if it weren't, in fact, pushing the agenda of a gold-plated, debilitated subject. The thought of a woman peeing reviles and excites Trump. His grammatical aberration when gushing about pussy, well, I'll get to that momentarily. If you can take it, if there's any trigger stuff happening, let me know. Um, the renewed engagement with tropes of Germanicity, the accumulation of geo-archival memory taps, and the recent preposterous provocations against Germany. Now, I don't have time for this now, but um, a lot comes from Germany and unresolved issues, including 9-11, don't, don't forget that Mohammed Atta and others were educated in Germany before they shot through the, the towers. Uh, there's something still coming from Germany that, um, that I do work on, but I, I don't want to um, beleaguer you with right now. And even the jokingly stated fact that nowadays one is fleeing to Germany, whereas in those days one was fleeing to America from Germany, should not be left to some scholarly sidebar. Though I now praise the scholar. Wait for it. Scholars under the regime of Trump are a targeted species, disdained and marked for controlled extinction. I will defend them, even if the feelings are not always mutual. And I myself have struggled with the university as an autoimmune lab that kills off any creative spark or sign of vitality. At the same time, yes, part of the university, especially in, in the US, poses as a sanctuary for politically correct faints. It houses dissidents, bookworms, and queers like no other institution of waning solidity. I will refrain from switching on the history channel that features more deplorable episodes ethical misconduct ascribable to university life, racist installations, despite affirmative action inlays also right now being attacked, of course, and so on. I take these moral deficits on in other texts. For now, though, I declare a truce and start a protective intervention on behalf of all those who want to study and experience a furlough from the peculiar lashings of the so-called real world. Derrida has indicated in his many works on the plights and innovative verve of the university, including in his important article, The University in the Eyes of Its Pupils, to which I refer you, that we owe the basic structuring of the university to 18th century German thought. I try to locate the crypts. This is post-Freudian um, work that some of us are doing in class, and, and we need to um, attend to it more seriously. So I try to locate the crypts and effects of the phantom, current and in recurrent events, prompted by historical snags or backslides. In support are tropes and elsewhere, I go after the repertory of recurring hits for which historical repression is responsible. For now, all I can delimit is a starting point, maybe indicating an aerial view of a symptom, 
geographically pinnable but stuffed with the excess of symbolicity. How's everyone doing? Can you handle this? I know we were protected from these awful reality bites, but and I apologize that we have to, I feel, call upon each other, one another, to think about it now. Trump's poses of buffoonery and his clownish propensity for linguistic reduction, the sheer stupidity and off-the-charts vulgarity of his claims and limited grasp of world-binding obligation, and he forfeits the ligature that resides in obligation. The way he sever he's a severing machine. Um, Part of the const so his trail of foreclosures in the psychoanalytic sense ever doubled in the material arrangements of his real estate business have left the world dumbstruck. Yet I would warn that that revulsion should serve only as a first level affect, part of a commando reactivity that needs to be refined, contextualized, no doubt even sublated. For as disturbingly destructive as his incursions and poses may be, they serve only to disclose what was already there. As if we had been living until now, for the most part, in what Heidegger calls a negative hallucination. Namely, in some ways, some of us did not see what was there. Something on the order of what Finsk has called a nihilistic disclosure has been exposed, if under the Germanic name Trump and manifested in its distorted human carrier. As alien, disturbing, and inassimilable as the traumatic invasiveness of the Trump brand has been since it crossed over from Germany to Queens to Manhattan, it would be wrong to treat it only as a loathsome aberration without secret roots in the makeup of the most enlightened and mature social structures and vigilant controls. In another context, Jean-Luc Nancy said, it doesn't suffice to condemn a man. One has to look into and probe, send out probes into what created the conditions that allowed such a thing to, to um, exist or, or take over or whatever it's doing. Untethered arrogance, proud conceits, and failures, success are brought up in the figures and disfigurations of Mr. Trump, but in fact give access to a disavowed shadow part of North America, the bright side of which is being concealed under the shit pile that Trump and company have produced recklessly, yet with decipherable intention and historical backup. Low blow bigotry is not new, nor can it be simply surrendered to the tides of time. What comes off as new is the revivalist fervor with which names such as deportation and pussy have been declassified for public announcement and are becoming legitimate prompters to prods of bullying and social atrocity. Concerns with precarity, such as outlined by Judith Butler, have been given the heave ho, and this ho is heaving. <laughs> as Lacan had predicted long ago, racism as rapport to the jouissance of the other cannot be done away with merely by erosive waves of enlightened movement where time itself and its splintered conceptual branches takes care of the cleanup of error, superstition, a degraded version of will to power that consists in oppressive slams of outcast players. In case we were under the illusion that women were welcome to sit at the table of historical deliberation, we were wrong or as the terrible lessons of the Balkans has taught us definitively, hatred can sit and simmer for decades before it reaches for the neighbor's throat again. The stir up of archaic pain belongs to one of Freud's enduring insights. 
hatred, ambivalence, aggression, and other human outreach programs in the spheres of negation cannot simply be repressed, but are bound to return and pound hard. For a long while, since I was a politically impassioned teen in high school, on the streets, in the detention hall, I have experienced America, I as an immigrant, um, as being on the brink of civil war, teetering over an abyss of irreconcilable differences, set in a rough clench that at moments of grace can resemble more of an embrace, part of a nation compelled against all odds to hug it out. This is a, an ambivalence that Goethe points out. C can you tell whether it's an embrace or is it a, a, a wrestler's um, killer clutch? Most of the time, though, it's a matter of clashing hard, and the cinema, with its excess of violent description, tells us a lot about our playbooks of destructive fervor. Still, in my imaginaire, Northern America was meant to gather us up in our tattered clothing, pointed us to a certain, if risky, horizon of promise, allowed us to dream it up according to outrageous protocols of becoming. The shutdown marked by Trump has thrown an ax into my imaginaire, momentarily congealed as a frozen sea to speak with Kafka. Bless you. By the way, I always speak with Kafka and must revert now to his recast of the Statue of Liberty, who was called Miss Liberty in my immigrant childhood. She was my first real crush a full-figured, book-holding being that I looked up to. In Kafka's America, the Statue of Liberty, legendary welcoming committee to the destitute, holds a dagger in her clenched fist. But let me return to Lacan's lucidity when it comes to the desire for racist resolution, the lure and abiding allure, continued allure of racism, the racist disposition, stoked, hungry, ever close at hand, is not merely reducible to a mistake or an effect of ignorance, though there's a lot of that bumble in its makeup. I don't think stupidity takes the lead role when it comes to prompting racist and misogynist assaults. We can stop whenever you've had enough, by the way. I'm, I'm going to give you some live feed until you, <laughs> where you can wrap it up. The other is seen to take away what you don't have, marking your deficiency, which gets traded out in projective waves of unabating envy and aggressive clawing at the facticity of the other's very existence. No one can live on ontological legitimacy alone but needs serious welcoming and encouragement as a daily practice. The syntax of I want you to be, as Arendt once described, the love for the refugee or endangered other. So one has to every day salute, welcome, bring in the, the destitute other. And in, in just saying, just offering a greeting you want them to be. I have no time for this, though we are obligated to make time for this, for reading, creating, practicing something like a reparative imperative when reading Lacan and Melanie Klein bifocally. Also, I will not get into his misogyny and pilfering feints when it comes to women analysts. I, what's a girl to do? Ah, don't get me started. We are surrounded by, masculine, by a masculinist SWAT team. Listen, Hegel call, very famously called women or woman the enemy of the community. I don't think that Hegel, who was in it to win it, was dialectically angling for the capture of powerful affect, for raising the stakes of friendship, and so on. So I'm going to skip a uh, thinking which we'll do elsewhere of, of why Hegel named woman the enemy and elsewhere the irony of 
the community. This could also be good news for some of us. By the way, do you know what it's like to be a girl? Chris? <laughs> to take corrosive insults all day long? To have to wrestle down insolence all the time? To wear yourself down proving and outdoing yourself? Overcompensating, pushing hard, becoming exhausted to the point of losing your voice or blanking? So much so that you can't even complain. Don't get me started. But let me back down in order to point out that Lacan's reflections on racism were re delivered in a work titled Television, Television, and addresses all sorts of technological insets, giving us a clue about the growing importance of medial projection when it comes to matters of social aggression particularly in, in terms of racism. Donald Trump is indissociable from television and its psychic tethers. The slogan, the whole world is watching, has taken another turn with decisive consequence in need of further exploration and trapping everyone in a dismally distorted reality world. To return to the misogynist cast of the moment, of course, there never has not been a misogynist wall of aggression against which to collapse. Trump didn't invent a particularly crass form of attack on women, but exposed its prevalence and became a loudspeaker for what has always been pelted against those of us so constructed provisionally and problematically, but I'm not going to argue this now, though one could state with conviction that it's precisely at a time when gendered being is shaken up considerably, proliferating according to mutating assignments, that there is a regressive return to woman, or thinking you know what a woman is, who diminished and puffed up at once, conscripted as pussy or lioness must bring up the roar. Again, I am not a woman, strictly speaking, but at times like this, okay, count me in. I'll stop with boasting that I have the biggest dick in the country. For Shakespeare, country slips easily into cunt, as you all know, and I'll stop dedicating my books to my dick. So let me stay with something like a rhetorical analysis. Can you take it? Trigger warning, are you okay? Yeah that shows even the harshest insult to slip on the ice of Trump's ongoing hostility, some of which remains unconsciously pillaging of something like a national psyche, while a great deal of the outtake belongs to a sinister calculation simply ascribable to corporate fascism and its rapacious takes. So it did seem like a turning point, do you remember? that Trump was audio trapped into revealing the invasive cast of his smuttiness. Do you remember Billy Bush? He was fired. Donald went on to be the POTUS, President of the United States. Billy, a remnant of the Bush family on the scene and screen, swiftly kicked to the wayside. In the following days, he had to apologize to his little girls and explained that what they had heard on the media was not him or was him, and now he's different, redemptively set on their side and on the side of all girls. Trump, in any case, had already disposed of most of that return of the repressed clan, the Bushes, that now incites nostalgia, however falsely remembered. Trump was not entirely wrong about the shit plate that the Bushes left us with, out of which he crept. The Bush boys may not throw down language about pussy-grabbing excitability, but they too contributed their share to the attack on women and produced a map of maternalized attack zones into which fighter pilots high on drugs and shooting up porn video amped up on rock and roll dropped their bombs. There are many ways to shut down women, even more to shut them up at home or on the fields of the pumped-up imaginary. One thing that was not caught on tape and to my knowledge received no airplay involves the grammatical aberration that landed one of Trump's outlandish statements. 
I am not certain what to make of the glitch, and um, I want to consider it with you briefly. Nor am I certain, at, at, as I once was when analyzing the syntactical disturbance and semantic pitfalls of the Bushian cannonade of language alerts, the consistently failed locution and violent relation to language ever gushing toxically onto killing fields. So I already analyzed um, the presidential linguistic uh, machines elsewhere of other presidents. But here, language so battered led one to wonder whether an abusive rapport to language does not trigger massive rounds of harm and other deeds of misfiring. Were these destructions of language of being not intricately wound up? Neglected language comes out hurting innocent bystanders. I do not include purposefully wielded distortion, what makes a poetry, performance art, and hip hop, and so on. Nor do I overlook the more or less normal dosage of catachresis that every speech act rhetorically enfolds. Catachresis meaning abuse of language, which happens every time you open your mouth, some of you. No, I'm kidding. Um, every rapport that language entertains entails abuse. And sometimes the most depraved are highly eloquent. This is something different, though, something like endangering neglect, stripping down language to a depleted status of refuse language, displaying flimsy performative tosses of a grammar school child on the edge of throwing a tantrum, reducing world to a limited field made to hold balled up energy, egological fits. I suspect that the medial success of the locution, you are fired, received ratings not only for its economical brutality, a staging of de decision and severance that more complicated zones of ambivalence and hesitation must repel. You are fired, signifiered. You are addressed in your nullity. You are counted out, driven away, called off and so on. Now I would want to hitch a ride on Blanchot, but I must res restrain myself. But let me say this, the celebrity signifier, you are fired, also fires off on the eliminated addressee, targets them as they are tagged out. The ironic edges of this exclamation on which Trump continues to feed. From day one, he tried to fire Obama. He is the commando officer of a huge firing squad that masquerades sometimes as a hiring machine, and so on. This is the performativity to which the Trump apparatus aspires, but I'm only in the early stages of putting together rhetorical analysis of highly contaminated stores of performative firepower. So anyway, I could go on. Maybe I'll go on for one page because um, it gets started now. But I think um, it's evening. You've had a long day, and I don't want to um, overstay here. But just to give you a sense, as if this were an infomercial or a teaser, let me say um, that I wanted to bring in the wobble of something that uh, could reveal to us something about his phobic stances. And this isn't only a matter of some sort of theory head trying to analyze what's taking place. I am desperately looking for some strategy here. So it, be, it, it behooves us to try to understand this, um, this thing um, and, and how it's put together and what makes it fall apart as well. So, you know, normally, if I can inv invoke this obsolescent term, like normal, one grabs a pussy. If that's what the aggressor is getting at, it may be a power grab, a belittling clutch, violent and illicit, a body assault, a reflex of childish or churlish indiscipline, 
Maybe that, that is why in some neighborhoods of slang usage, it may be called a snatch. To grab pussy or to throw down a synecdocal reduction on a woman who is in any case always reduced if Lacanian psychoanalysis is right to something lacking, a lack, what one does not have. In cooking and other arts, in wide areas of science, reductions have their plate, even their prestige. But Donald did not revert to this locution. He has boasted, and this is of some note, that he was grabbing by the pussy. So one doesn't do that. This by is something that won't get by. And we do have also other atrocious utterances that, and racist ditties about grabbing by the tail or toe. One grabs by the horns or balls, but one never grabs by the pussy. Um, so this indicates different acts, these locutions, one unquestionably intrusive, and the other possibly more troubled to the extent that it must come from an imaginary prompt where little Donald or little Hans, uh, a Freudian figure, little hands, we might say, <laughs> must disavow mother's castration. When you're a celebrity riding the F factor, and that's Adorno's marker for hot spots of Northern American fascism, he tracks the F factor, the statement seems to go, you do not have to face castration, hers or yours. Beyond the self-articulating consequence that the statement carries, it shows that the terrible responsibility linked to the assumption of powerlessness has been voided. So I'm now kind of hinging an entire argument about his particular glitching on the misuse of something that he should have been able, disabled to say, but he introduced this by the pussy. One doesn't say by. Uh, so what does that do and how does that even destabilize the intended obscenity, and what does it disclose about a refusal to um, even degrade woman according to normative, grammatical, um, conventional terms. So um, this, this leads me to thinking about the aporatic, uh, so the aporia, the paradoxes, the collapsing of power, at the helm, the exhaustion of something that happens in the disavowal even of um, what he assigns as a metonymy of woman. And um, yet, I do want to caution that it, it's not just his aberration and failure to find a locution to, to kind of funnel his aggression, but every leader finds her shadow part in the lack of constraint and narcissistic blowout episodes generated by the Trump assumption of power and powerlessness. There's a contagion, a drift of contagion all over the world, and that's something that I'm trying to track as if I were a disease control center. And um, I'm not saying that what his distortion does is lacking bite or is harmless. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying we have something that grammatically doesn't work. And, and I'm trying to read all of the implications with Kafkan precision and Midrashic uh, hysteria, I suppose. So we are in the hands reputedly undersized but punishing, capable of outsized smackdowns of an endangering cipher. Um, so I think I feel like stopping, even though I didn't get to my argument, only because of my exhaustion at this point. I'd like to open this up to um, your, your remarks or questions or commentaries or concerns. Um, this. This is something that, that has many, many more stages. 
I just want to, I guess one of the things I wanted to convey is even in the most vulgar moments where we think we understood what was going on, he faltered, he made a mistake, he couldn't even get that right. But how do you read something like a grammatical mistake that surprisingly impinges on world shattering? Thank you.